let's quickly turn to the Lord's word this morning, the gospel of Matthew chapter 25, a parable that Jesus spoke about the wise and foolish virgins. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Jesus spoke this parable in response to his disciples who questioned him and asked him uh, what the signs would be of the end of the age. And we find in the previous chapter in verse 24, it says that uh, in verse 2, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that should not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And then Jesus goes on to, to explain what the signs would be, the signs in the environment, how people would be. And he gives several stories explaining and highlighting the fact that the, the coming of the Son of Man will be unexpected. Nobody will know, nobody will be able to predict the, the, the time or the hour or the day that the Son of Man appears. But the overriding theme of all these parables and sayings of Jesus in this regard is to emphasize the importance of being ready, of being ready when Jesus comes. Now, when we look at this parable... It's important to realize that a parable is simply an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And as we read through it, we should not get too caught up in all the minute details and try to assign a meaning for every character or everything that happens in the story, but rather to realize that there, that there is an overall message. There's an overall message that Jesus was trying to, to get out to his disciples and likewise to us this morning. There's something overall from this story that he wants us to learn and he wants us to, to deposit in our hearts. If we look at... Um, what exactly happened here, uh, Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven will be like this. And then he begins to tell a story. And he talks about 10 virgins who are getting ready to meet the bridegroom. And he talks about how they, 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 there were 10 of them and they had lamps. And they had lamps because they needed their lamp to be lit. And with the light, they would welcome the bridegroom. And the Jewish custom was such that the bridegroom would come with his friends and then he would take the bride. Uh, and that would be a joyous occasion where he takes the bride from her dwelling place and, and takes her with his friends. He takes her to a new place. And, and that, that would signify an absolute change of life and a change of environment for her. And, and here this story depicts that kind of a custom where it talks about these, these virgins who are there and they are ready and they are waiting for the bridegroom to come and they don't know exactly when he's going to come, uh, but they are ready and waiting and they, and they should be prepared for the bridegroom's coming. But there is a sobering thought at the beginning of this story because it tells us that there were five who were wise and there were five who were foolish. And uh, as the story progresses, we see that the, the wise ones had brought oil. They were ready. They were ready so their lamps could be lit when the bridegroom came. But the foolish ones had lamps. The lamps had wick, but, wicks, but they had not brought along oil. So, so when the bridegroom came, they arose from their slumber. And all ten of them were slumbering. And they arose and they realized that they did not have oil for their lamps. And so they turned to the wise uh, virgins and they asked them to share their oil with them. 
And the response of the wise virgins is, is sometimes you could think that this sounds a little selfish. Why were they not willing to share? But you find that it's, it's a moment where each one is for his own. And you, if, if the wise virgins were to have shared their oil, the, no, neither of them would have been ready to meet the, the bridegroom because they wouldn't have had enough for themselves and neither would the ones they shared with have enough oil for their lamps either. So it would have been a lose-lose situation for everybody. So we find at that time they tell the foolish virgins, "You, we cannot share with you, you'll have to go and buy your own and come back. And in that moment when they go to do that, the bridegroom appears and he takes the ones who are ready and the ones who are not ready are left behind. And in this story, we know that the bridegroom is a depiction of Jesus because he's going to return one day and he's waiting for us, his bride. Jesus' bride is the church. And so collectively, we are the virgins who should be ready and waiting for the coming of the bridegroom. But sadly, from this story, we can make a few observations. First of all, the ten virgins who were, who were waiting in expectation for the bridegroom, when we see that five of them were wise and five of them were foolish, at first glance we might think five of them were the believers and five uh, signify unbelievers. But when you look closely, you realize that all ten were waiting in expectation for the bridegroom. So we are not talking about people who are not waiting for the bridegroom, who are not looking forward for his coming, who are not having some kind of an expectation that the bridegroom would take them with him. These are this, this, the, ten, the ten virgins are, are, are the, the collective bride of Christ, the church, the people who are as a body looking forward to the coming of Christ and looking in expectation and expecting that the bridegroom will take us with him when he comes back to claim his people, to claim his own. But the sobering thought we find is that even though we are part of the body of Christ and even though we might feel that we are ones who are waiting in expectation for the coming of Christ, the sobering thought is that it's possible to be foolish even while we are waiting in expectation for the coming of Christ. It's possible to be foolish in such a way that we are not watchful, we are, we are negligent, we have not got ready or prepared in certain aspects of our life. And, and the saddest part of it all is that that ill-preparedness and that negligence and that foolishness leads to consequences which are indeed dire. The door was shut on the five virgins and they could not join the, the wedding feast. Now we know then when Christ, that when Christ appears and, and when the rapture takes place, it's those who are ready to meet the Lord who will be taken up with him. But it's possible that it's God's people, even though we look forward to his coming and maybe sometimes we delude or deceive ourselves into thinking that we are ready, it's possible that as God looks at our lives, he sees that there is no oil. He sees that the wicks are not trimmed. He sees that there is some negligence or some ill-preparedness on our part and somehow we are not ready. And in that crucial moment when he comes, suddenly we get a revelation that we are not ready for the coming of the king. And we may scramble around like the foolish virgins trying to borrow faith or trying to borrow prayer or trying to borrow some deeds from some others who are around us, the ones who are wise, the ones who are prepared. And, and it is in that chilling moment that we are going to discover that we cannot borrow those things at that moment. We cannot go and get help from another in that moment. In that time, we cannot scramble around and try to do the things that we should have done all this time. We cannot suddenly in that instant be prepared and get ready. It is too late. It's going to be a moment where, where no one else can step up to save us, where no one else can step up to help, where no one else can, can pray over us or, or, or share some of their resources with us because it's, it's a moment where each one will bear his own load and we will come to Christ on our own merit, so to speak, at that moment. But Jesus spoke this parable as a warning and he spoke it as an instruction because in the final verse in verse 13, He's, 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 he's telling the disciples, this is my advice to you. Watch therefore, 
for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. He says several things in those verses. One is that the coming of Christ, the coming of the Son of Man is sure. It is absolutely sure. There are more prophecies about the second coming of Christ than there were about the first coming of Christ. And yet he came as a little baby. And now as we go through his word, we see that there are many more prophecies that, that tell us that Christ will come again. And he's coming as a glorious king to take his bride. And I know that we all want to be part of that. We don't want to be the foolish virgins. So we know that the coming of Christ is absolutely sure. But Jesus also says, no one knows the day or the hour. And that's how it was for the virgins. They knew that the bridegroom would come. When he was delaying, they slept. And that was okay because we get on with our lives while we wait for the bridegroom. We don't go to a mountaintop. We don't resign from our jobs. We don't do crazy things. But we get on with our lives living in the way that God wants us to live. Because even this earthly life is a gift that God has given us. So we have to live. We have to go through our, our life and we have to love and serve the Lord and walk through this life but yet we have to watch because we don't know when the bridegroom will come he's definitely coming but we don't know when and when Jesus spoke this parable he was emphasizing that we you don't know the day nor the hour and that's not important sometimes we try to figure out by events in history and by putting things together when is the day when is the hour how can we be ready like that but Jesus never said go and find out the day or the hour go and fast and pray and see if you can figure out he never said this is something I'm waiting to reveal to you he never said any of those things he said no one knows the day or the hour but I am coming. And what was his one instruction in the light of the fact that the Son of Man was one day coming? His instructions were to watch therefore. And to watch in this context means to be alert, to be vigilant, and to be prepared. To be ready for the coming of the King. And as we look at our own lives, it's a, it's, a, it's a calling to us to be people who are spiritually awake, spiritually vigilant, sp spiritually ready for the coming of Christ. And that's a choice that we make on a daily basis to be ready for the coming of Christ. It's a choice. It's a series of decisions. It's a lifestyle in, in which we form ourselves, we form our lives from day to day so that we are ready and waiting and alert and vigilant for the coming of Christ. And this morning, just for a few moments, I want to look at a few passages that, that talk to us about being watchful and, and, and about being ready. Because even as I was reading this, this, the, the, this story, I myself was thinking about the areas in my life which are not really ready for the coming of Christ. Areas in which I would be ashamed or I would be scared or I would be ill-prepared if Christ were to come and see those things and to see the ill-preparedness in our lives. And I know many of us are in that position. It's important for us to be watchful and to be ready because we know that as every day passes by we are getting nearer and nearer to the coming of Christ when we see the happenings in our world when we see the things that are taking place we, we, we look at the biblical prophecies and we can see that the coming of Christ draweth near just a couple of days ago when when uh, the Egyptian plane was hijacked uh, I was in the car and having a conversation with my kids and I thought I'll just tell them about this so I was explaining to them how this plane was hijacked and and uh, now there are some people who are hostage and they were listening with their ears wide open and uh, then they asked me why why are these things happening why do people do things like this and uh, and I immediately said you know this 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 is what what Jesus predicted would happen, that people would be against one another, there would be wickedness, wickedness would be abound, there would be wars, there would be nations that fight against each other. And then I said, and uh, people will be wicked and, 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 and people will be disobedient to parents. And as I said that, their eyes popped wide open. And then my five-year-old son said, I don't want to be a person like that. <laughs> I think they kind of realized at that moment that their own actions were leading to the coming of Christ. 
But you know, it's important to tell our children about these things because they too need to be ready for the coming of, the, of Christ in their own way. And in the limited understanding that they have, we need to not wait till they are older, but we need to take every opportunity that we have to sensitize them to the things of God, to the happenings in the kingdom of God so that they understand. And in their own way, um, they open their heart to the Lord and they are able to understand the things of God as far as their capacity is according to their age. Sometimes we neglect to do that and we leave it for another season. But I believe that we need to take advantage of every chance we have over everyone whom we have influence. How do we be watchful in all things? How do we keep ourselves spiritually alert and vigilant and waiting for the coming of the Lord? As we go through scripture, we find many passages in which we are told that we must always be doing these things. There are certain things that we must always be doing. We must always keep our fire burning for the Lord. We must always have a passionate heart for the Lord. We must always be pleasing Him in all that we do. And so we know that we are to keep ourselves fresh in our walk with God and, and constantly walking in, in Him as well. In Deuteronomy, we are told that we should... We should be always talking about the things that God has done. And we should bind them as frontlets on our eyes and on our wrists and paint them on the doorposts of our house. And, and it talks about how we should be always remembering the glorious acts of God. Always be talking about the glorious acts of God and always be teaching them to the generations to come. And like that, there are many things that the Bible says that we must be doing all the time. And many of those things, when we do them all the time and when we remember them all the time, we are actually keeping ourselves watchful and vigilant and alert and in expectation of the coming of the bridegroom. And that's in contrast to how we sometimes are when we go through difficult seasons in our life and we allow ourselves to be less watchful. We allow ourselves to drift away from the Lord at times. We allow that, that relationship with God to kind of take a back seat in our lives. And we think that that's okay because it's just for a season. Sometimes we talk to people and we try to engage them in the things of God. And they say, I'm going through a, a bad time where just give me some time that I can come back to the Lord. Or give me some time that I can come back to serving Him. I, this is not a good season for me. And while it's true that we go through difficult seasons and difficult times in our life, that watchfulness and that alertness, that vigilance is something that we cannot afford to slack on. We cannot afford to slack and we cannot afford to let the oil run out. We cannot afford to be uh, ill-prepared for the coming of the bridegroom because let me remind you, we don't know the day or the hour. Turn with me to... 2 Timothy chapter 4, where Paul spoke to Timothy and gave him certain instructions. And as we look at these, we see some of the ways in which we can keep ourselves watchful and vigilant for the coming of the Lord. From verse 2, it says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And you can see that happening in our world and happening in our nation right now, as many people are led astray by teachings that are not biblical and not the whole gospel. And verse 5 says, But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. What was Paul telling to Timothy as the pastor of this church? He was telling him, Timothy, you need to be watchful. You need to endure affliction. You need to do the work of an evangelist and you need to fulfill your ministry. And in a sense, though, though Paul was saying this to Timothy as a pastor, we can all take these words and apply them to our life because it teaches us how to be vigilant and how to be prepared and how to be watchful and how to be ready for the coming of the Lord. He talks about enduring 
enduring affliction. And not just for Timothy, but every one of us in different times and seasons of our lives, the reality is that we are going to go through affliction. We're going to go through trouble. We're going to go through trials. We're going to go through sickness and difficulty. We're going to go through periods where we lack or we, we, uh, we are desperate for the provision of God, but we don't see it. But what was the instruction to Timothy? The instruction was to endure the affliction, to go through it, to come out of it, to tolerate it and not be slack at that time. Don't allow the afflictions in our lives to take us away from the Lord, to take us away from, from loving him or serving him of, of having faith and having hope in him, but to endure that affliction, to be steady through the times of affliction, not to waver, but to hold on through every affliction. And I know personally, some of you going through times of affliction, some of you contact us and you say, pray, I don't know how much longer I can hold on during this time, but I, I, I just want to strengthen you with God's word this morning. You have to endure through this affliction. God is with you. He has not turned his face away from you, but affliction comes to all of us in different forms, in different ways, and in different uh, levels as we live in this fallen world. And as long as we live in this fallen world, we will have different kinds of afflictions in our lives, in our bodies, but, but you need to endure through this time because when you endure, even through your affliction, if Christ returns, you will be ready. Because you have not fallen away. You have not allowed the affliction to, to, to make you turn your back on the Lord or lose your faith and hope and your trust in Him. So for those of you facing some affliction this morning, we strengthen you in the power of the Holy Spirit this morning. Be strengthened. Be strengthened even as we sang this morning that we will rise up on wings like eagles. And God will renew our strength. Be strengthened by the word of the Lord this morning that you need to endure this affliction and go through. It's just for a time and it will pass. Paul also told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. And what does that mean? It, does, it means that the work of an evangelist is the work of one who shares the gospel. And, in, and we are all called to do the work of an evangelist. We are all called, even as Nishi sang this morning, we are all called to go. We are all called to share. We are all called to be that light in the place where God has, has placed us. All around us, in our homes, in our schools, in our places of work, in our neighborhoods, there are people who need the light of the gospel. And you and I are called to do the work of an evangelist. And we must do this with diligence. We must do this with faithfulness. We must do this intentionally and purposefully until the day that Christ returns. Because, you know, you don't want to be one of those people in that moment where Christ returns, you suddenly remember all the people that you never shared the gospel with. All the times you thought, this is not the right time, I'll keep it for another time. And then you go running and try at that moment to share, but it's going to be too late and the door will be shut. And think of all those people on whom the door will be shut and there will be eternal consequences for them. Because you and I didn't share the gospel. Some of us are living in homes where there are unbelievers, our own family members, but yet we do not live in a way that the gospel goes out to them, that the light of the gospel is shared with them. It's not always with words. Sometimes it's with words. But all the time it's with our actions and even in our own homes and even with people we move closely around. They must see that, that we, we have the light of Christ in us. They must see the power of the gospel working in our lives. And that's the way we do the work of an evangelist, by living for Christ. And letting our lives and our actions and our thoughts and our motivations all speak the truth of the gospel to the people we move around with. And there are some people whom we come in contact with and it's quite possible that you would be the only Christian that they would ever know in their lifetime. And if that is the case, that responsibility is on you. God has placed you there for a purpose. You are there to do the work of an evangelist. You may think you're in your office to do a certain job of work, but that's a secondary purpose. You are there because you are there to do the work of an evangelist. And this does not mean that you don't work in that place, but rather you get up in the morning there and you take a great big Bible and place it on your desk and you start preaching to the people who come to you for consultations. No, 
You have to, con con you have to do your work in a God-honoring way. But while you do your work in a God-honoring way, you have to realize that God has placed you there as the salt and as the light. And in the way that you do your work, and in the way that you speak, in the way that you love people, in the way that you show compassion on them, you are doing the work of an evangelist and so preparing and being watchful for the coming of Christ. There is no other season, there is no other time. The time is now. And the time is passing us by, my friend, very quickly. And while this time is passing us by, there are some of us who are quietly waiting with our mouth shut, little realizing that when we do that, we are the foolish, negligent, ill-prepared virgins who are not prepared for the coming of Christ. Finally, Paul says to him, fulfill your ministry. Do what God has called you to do. What God had called Timothy to do was something specific. What God calls you and I to do is something specific and unique only to you and I. I cannot do what God has called someone else to do. If I don't do what God caused me to do, that remains undone because God wanted me to do it. And surely he does raise up others so that his kingdom goes on and, 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 and his work goes forth. But still, there is a, a, a job that is given to you and I. There is a calling that's given to each one of us. And we need to be faithful to God and in every season do what he has called us to do. There is no season to serve and season to rest. There is no time like that. If you turn uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible because every time I want to throw up my hands in despair, I go to this verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, which says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So we are always to be people who are abounding in the, in the work of the Lord. The work may change in different times of our lives. The, the capacity may change at different times of our lives. So what exactly we do may change at different times. But yet we are called to be people who are always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always. Different capacities. Sometimes you may be in situations where you cannot do that kind of a work. But you have to seek the Lord and do what you can do. And that's God's call to each and every one of us. Don't take back seats at different stages of your life. There will always be difficulties. There will always be challenges. There will always be something that seems more important. But God has a call on us. His call is that we be steadfast and immovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. And it doesn't stop there. It says to know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And this is important because when you labor for the Lord through many years, there are going to be times of disappointment. There's going to be times of discouragement. And there are going to be times when you think there's no fruit. I'm serving, serving. There's no fruit. There's nothing that I can see. Nobody cares. Nobody appreciates. And all the people that I've invested in have, have, have not come amounted to anything. There's no point. But there's a, a, an encouragement here to know that your labor is never in vain in the Lord. You may not always see the fruit to your own eyes, but you have to keep on pressing on. You have to keep on being steadfast. You have to keep on being a mover in you have to keep on being immovable. You have to keep on abounding in the work of the Lord because you have to know that, that your labor is not in vain and also that God is never unjust to forget what you have done. People will always forget, I tell you. You can do the biggest things for people, but sometimes they just turn their eyes and they walk away. They don't remember anything that you have done. But God is so radically different. Amen. He has an awesome memory. He never forgets. He never forgets. 
every sacrifice, every tear, every seed sown, every life touched. God is not unjust to forget your labor. And so you have to keep on pressing on. You have to keep on fulfilling your ministry. As long as the Lord has given us life and breath to be on this earth, there is something that he intends to do through us. And as his church, I pray that we will not be 50-50 like the virgins, but we will be 100%. That when Christ comes, that we will rise up as his body, that we would all be ready to meet him. We would all be prepared. We would all be watchful and vigilant. We would be ready. The church in Sardis had this spoken about them. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you, were, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Who is he speaking to here? He's speaking to the church, the church in Sardis, not outsiders, not unbelievers. And God was saying, you have an appearance that you are alive, but actually you are dead. So it looks like you're waiting in expectation for the coming of Christ. But only I know that inside you are not prepared. You are not ready. And then that admonition again, that warning again, be watchful. Be watchful. Strengthen the things which remain. That means you are not completely dead. There is a glimmer of hope. There is something inside you that can be revived. As you look back and remember the things that you received, the things that you heard, hold fast and repent. So that when Jesus Christ comes like a thief in the night and we don't know the day or the hour, we will not be left behind, but we will be taken up with him. I believe that's God's word for us this morning.